to The Trek. The Trek is a new Civics Unplugged series where community members participate in meaningful discussions on topics that are too often neglected when thinking about building the future. Through prompting questions and provocations, we venture together into complex but important conversations related to building the future and democracy. We understand that this work requires ongoing dialogue, but it's a journey worth trekking through. Uh, my name is Madison and I'm a high school senior from Burgess, Oklahoma, joined by some of our amazing community members. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about freedom of speech. And we first started our conversation with a word association. So if we can go in the order of the names listed here, you all can say your one to three words, explain them, and before that, give a brief introduction. Jonah, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I was trying to come up with a way to make this fit inside the rules, and I'm just going to give up and break them again. Uh, fire in a crowded theater. Wait, Jonah, who are you, though? You got you to gotta oh, tell Oh, I'm me. sorry. I jumped to the word association. That's my bad. Um, yeah, I'm Jonah. I'm 18 years old. I'm a high school senior from St. Louis, Missouri. And why do you say fire in a crowded theater? It, I can't remember what Supreme Court justice was, but it was the Supreme, it was the standard that the Supreme Court set for when you exit the realm of free speech and enter the realm of just dangerous stuff that is, that you don't have a right to say, like that's where it isn't considered speech anymore. Jonah, was it Shank versus the United States? That sounds right to me. Um, Does Ashley know the answer to this? Yeah, like, please tell me. Um, Anyways, Julia, oh, that's, that's not. go for it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Julia. I'm 23 years old. I'm currently living, living in Pennsylvania. Um, when I think of freedom of speech, I think of choice and silenced, I would say. Um, choice, I guess like the more choice people have, the less limitations that they feel are put on them. And I would think freedom of speech um, really aligns with people feeling that like they have some type of choice and um, silenced. If people feel constrained by others in their words, um, they feel like they're being silenced, obviously, and people get suspicious of that and also triggered by that. Good stuff. Bryson? Um, hi, I'm Bryslyn. I am a freshman from Florida. And when I think of freedom of speech, kind of the first word that comes to my mind is necessary because I'm a very vocal person. And if we didn't have freedom of speech, I would probably be locked up every single day for the rest of my life because I just speak my mind called constantly. So that's the first word that comes to my brain. All right. Um, hey everyone, I'm Mariam. I am a senior from the suburbs of Chicago, and the thing that immediately comes to mind is safety versus liberty, because I know that's a discussion that comes up a lot surrounding freedom of speech, and often comes up in terms of like when it's appropriate to like limit freedom of speech, if at all, so that's definitely something that comes up a lot. Um, cool. Hey everyone, my name is Ashley. I am a high school senior in Vancouver, Washington. Um, when I think about freedom of speech, um, I think about identity. I don't know. I feel like a lot of like free speech is, is like associated with like how we express ourselves and how we want to bring ourselves into the world. Um, and then I think about truth. Um, I think there are a lot of different ver versions of truth that exist, um, but I feel like the goal is to be ethical and I don't know, try to Actually, I don't know where I'm going, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I want to put power and feedback loops. 
and we'll, we'll we'll talk about those questions or topics in the future of the question. Okay, um, I'm gonna put polarizing uh, and democracy, just because freedom of speech has become a more polarizing issue uh, than it previously was in democracy because. I think free speech lays the foundation for democracy. There's a reason why it's the First Amendment, and it's what distinguishes us from so many other places around the world. Gary, quick question. When you said uh, Ken was going to join us, are you talking about Ken White, or is this a different Ken? Uh, I don't know who Ken White is. Um, Ken from Ethereum Foundation. Oh, OK. That's probably a different Ken. I, I Googled that quote, and Marian was right. It is uh, Schneck. The United States, and this article cites Ken White. So, I figured I should ask. Um, does anyone want to start us off with a question or provocation? Um, I'm interested in hearing more about Gary, your answer of like feedback loops and how that ties into freedom of speech. Kenneth is here. Kenneth, can you hear us? Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Operating on crypto time. Okay. Uh, do you want to? Um, so, just uh, I think you'll, you'll quickly see how this goes. Um, it's like kind of a free flowing, semi structured, uh, like only lightly structured dialogue on freedom of speech. Um, we started with a word association. Um, do you have one one to three words that come to mind when you think of freedom of speech? And then just introduce yourself very, very briefly. Um, uh, word association, freedom of speech, uh, censorship less. <laughs> like, is it, is that censorship less? C censorship less? I, I, well, I meant to say censorship resistant. Okay. Um, well, yeah, why don't we put that? But I, I realize, yeah, th those are two words, right? That's in between. That's good. Um, are, the, are those your two words? Or, uh, those, those are my two words. Okay, cool. The first thing that comes to mind is just something. Right. Yeah. Those are good. Um, so, Mariam, to answer your question, uh, one thing that comes to mind is how, um, let's say you censor someone um, it fuels the censored person's fire, right? It makes them go to more extreme routes that are, go beyond uh, speech because they have no speech anymore. It's like pouring gasoline on uh, unstable um, kind of chemical compounds, right? Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Um... I guess like that isn't even somewhere that my mind just naturally goes when I think of freedom of speech. So it's interesting to think about how like suppressing freedom of speech can actually fuel things that people are trying to like stop. Exactly. They, yeah, okay, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, can anyone else think of a feedback loop that relates to freedom of speech? Uh, I guess if you look at it in the opposite in the opposite case too, that could be a thing. Um, like so, for example, if you just don't let anybody talk, then what you have, and that's like the founding founding ethos of social media sites like Parler, Gab, and whatever, then you get um, everybody just like spewing random stuff and truth gets kind of drowned out in the noise because all that it's required for something to have legitimacy is for a lot of people to say it. And that's why you see things like Parler and Gab turning into these platforms for the far right, um, which is just, like you can democratize a lot of things. That's what we're trying to do here. But there are certain things that are just true, whether people like them or not. Yeah, and to Jonah's point, like if, 
um, let's say all these polarizing conversations are kind of being pushed to different platforms, like different sides um, of the conversation, then tying it back into feed feedback loops, other people within that realm aren't seeing the ideas and opinions of the other side or whatever it is. Um, so they're not receiving any feedback. And it's just, again, like to Gary's point, fueling the fire um, of their side. I think that's something else we can know about feedback loops is that like, if you're having a conversation with somebody and you're telling them not to say whatever they're saying. Um, this is kind of similar to Gary's point, but just like if you're telling them, like if you're giving them evidence for why they shouldn't be like saying whatever they're saying, even if they can see your point, a lot of the time stubborn people will like still continue to say the things that they're saying no matter what, because feedback loops can get very heated if they go the wrong way. Um, so yeah, I just think that it's important to know how emotions can um, kind of blur feedback loops. Yeah, like I was reading something that was kind of depressing, but like it was like, even if you give people like the full spectrum of like information, like on both sides, like people will still self-select for whatever information they think is more correct and don't think like that is accurate. And so like, even if people like all start off with the same information, like you'll still end up like having like polarized points of views because like people have their, like their natural, like, I don't know, inclinations for what they believe is like right and what they believe is like true. And then it just like diverges from there. I like that a lot because the, the truth is sort of the social construct, right? In, in a lot of cases, social construct and social contract are, are what determine what is technically like true in your world, right? Someone who is blind doesn't know, uh, you know, color. So telling them what color and describing them what color is, is, is a very, very different concept. Um, so, you know, with freedom of speech, technically, you know, truth is really subjective in terms of like what your echo chamber or what it is that you're hearing and, and sort of like your own microcosm of the macrocosm of the world. Uh, and you see that as the truth. And so that's what you hold as your truth. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's factual or you know, an opinion, um, but that is still the truth that someone else uh, believes. You know, like how do you how do you tell someone that um, that feels like this is dangerous, this is evil, that it's not true? Because those are just so like mushy terms already. It's not like you can't like measure. I mean, there's no like widely agreed upon measure of evil or good or like you know. So that's why politics it's so easy to just confirm um, what you already believe. Yeah, so, like, sorry, okay. go ahead. Okay, um, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, one thing that's interesting is that people, depending on different media that people see, and I don't mean media as in like media companies, I mean media as in like written, verbal, video, whatever. Uh, depending on what medium people use to learn something, has a big effect on what they remember about it, whether or not they remember it. So you might learn something that you believe to be true and then later hear, oh, that's false. And in that moment, you'll realize, oh, the source that's contradicting this thing is better, more accurate. I'm going to believe that source. But then a little bit later, if you're asked to remember which is the true thing, which is the false thing, you're more likely to remember certain media more than you are to remember true so if you see something in a video you're more likely to remember it than if you see it over text so if someone you ever heard of the phrase the medium is the message no but that's interesting uh it's, it's a brilliant phrase from this sort of philosopher philosopher guy from the late 1900s um marshall McLuhan, who uh, predicted that humans would not be able to deal with the rapid advancements of communication technology like TV and then internet. It just, it affects us in ways that we, you know, 
we barely understand or don't understand. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, what is, what is, uh, Um, I guess I challenge Ken to say more about censorship resistance. I guess that's a provocation. I guess it's hard, right? Censorship resistance is something that is polarizing. Oh, can you hear me? Hello. Can we hear you? Oh, okay. Um, censorship resistance is is polarizing on both ends, right? And it's not something that hasn't already been brought up. But I think if uh, I think we're thinking, setting, is, am I the only one? Okay, kind of your settings yeah, are, are like, oh, yeah, I think that might be your headphones. Okay, you can't hear me. Yeah, we can't. Just check your audio settings on Zoom. It says click headphones. On the little triangle thing. Yeah, it says it says it's headphones. Like, uh, microphone. Everyone says they hear me fine. I'm hearing hearing no. you fine. Yeah. Yeah. You guys a tech guy. <laughs> I hear Gary and hey. Ken. Hey, Gary, can you hear me now? You can also unplug your um, your headset. Maybe I'll maybe I'll text you. Everyone else can hear. This is, this is... Gary, can you not hear any of us? We said we can hear him fine. Kenneth is censoring himself. Wow, this is this is. <laughs> awesome. can hear no, Gary can't hear us either. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, Gary, <laughs> oh my God! Did you, did you mute your <laughs> Ashley? Do you want to talk about how uh, blockchain could help with censorship? I I texted him, but I don't think he's uh. He's yeah, either. wait. Can he like not see the Zoom chat? Like I don't know. <laughs> can someone like Slack him or something? Uh, yeah, oh that's what I'm God. doing. <laughs> but Ken, you should definitely idiot. talk about censorship once Gary is. <laughs> oh, do you know what I talk about blockchain? Um, yeah, I talk about blockchain. So dumb. All right, we got this. Can you hear us now? Yep, yep. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, censorship resistance is. Uh, it's polarizing at both ends. It's something I feel like this has already been talked about, but um, when you're pushed to one side or the other, you're going to sort of try to swing a pendulum, right? The the way that a pendulum works, it, it always goes back and forth. And so every time you push it in one direction, it always kind of flips back in the other side. Um, so thinking about like a, a feedback loop of how this can polarize, you can think about like governments, you think about like policies, um, and how someone is going to react to, uh, you know, being told they can't do something or that they have to do something. Um, it generally tends to either suppress or oppress uh, different demographics to have to confine or to, to be contained in that kind of uh, oppressive government, I guess, rule, uh, or the opposite of like, you know, wanting to do anything possible to get away from it. Um, and you see that a lot today in, in sort of like, uh, even in like Hong Kong, right? Um, you know, the more you push away from it, the more you, you know, arrest uh, the, I guess, the democratic leaders, uh, you're going to have uh, a larger groundswell of people who want the opposite because they see what's going on. Um, and the, the harder you kind of knock them down, uh, the more people start to like get galvanized because of that. Ashley, any thoughts? How do you make something censorship resistant? I like, I don't know, I'm just confused. Like it, it in general, how do you make something censorship resistant? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Looking at like Twitter, right? Twitter is is this this you know tech platform that lets us sort of say whatever we want, and and in theory, it, it should allow us to. Um, but when you stop someone like Donald Trump from saying whatever it is that he wants to say um, for the, I guess, the better of the country, um, I think most people see this as like, yes, you're stopping the, um, you're stopping him from inciting violence and, and inciting sort of like this, you know, this crew of people or like this, this like minority of people who, who really truly believe that, you know, something is wrong and they have to do something. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't do, you know, I think the in, intention there is, is for me is right. Um, at least what I believe, but for the opposite, right. There are for every, like one of me, there's another, uh, you know, alternate universe me that says like, you know, this is actually really bad because if you can stop Trump from saying something, who's to say that, you know, Jack Dorsey just doesn't have um, some other inclination to say, I'm going to permanently ban, um, you know, Barack Obama from trying to do, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, you know, there, like, where is there an actual sort of like bound where you uh, can or cannot do or say something? Um, but if you look at something like a, a peer to peer system where uh, you can, there, there's like little to no moderation. Um, like a, like a, a 4chan, um, you know, you have this very open world to, to say or do whatever it is that you want to, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's right or wrong, right? It's, that's, that's something subjective that someone else kind of posits on it. Um, but there are systems that even if you do that, the question is how far can you go, right? There's, there's always that pendulum of like, you know, just because it's completely resistant, is that really what it, that you want to hear? And that's that's sort of the same question behind like parlor. Um, you know, just because it's it's allowed, and just because you can do it, should you? Yeah, yeah. To bring up that point, I brought up to Gary earlier, like talking about boundaries and such. Just like in my childhood neighborhood yesterday, like along with like the president getting suspended, there was like four neighborhood moms who got suspended on Twitter just because like they retweeted like obviously something that um, was insinuating violence or I don't know what it was, something that had to do with what Twitter is putting guidelines on. But just like in my suburban neighborhood, like four moms got kicked off Twitter, which is interesting. Um, so I thought that was also a point to bring up. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, like, like, I just want to think about, like, because, yes, I do see that line. And, like, I don't think, like, the solution is necessary to, like, restrict speech, right? Like, I, like, I think, I just, like, I think about, like, the need to, like, build a system where, like, you don't have to, like, guess the credibility of a source while, like, you're trying to learn about a topic. Like, because, because people are going to just balance it out, right? Like, like Ken, you said, like, you know, like there's like you on this side, but then like another Ken on like the other side uh, would like yeah. just like say the opposite thing. Um, like I don't know how like this would work, but like, it, like it it needs to be okay to be wrong. But if like you're wrong, like, but if like so. But if someone is usually wrong, like that information should be like conveyed, yeah. and like people should be able to like know that. Yeah. So um, I want to pose a question related to that. Thank you, Ashley. Um, what might need to exist in order for um, free speech to to work to advance human flourishing? And so we can put here the first one, some kind of um, system or set of systems that uh, keep an account of credibility, probably across many dimensions.
this is just like a point that like on initiative on social media and such lately that like um, at, at first it was kind of like what but um, it's a good way not to silence people but to warn people about the information that they're taking it in on Twitter and like on Instagram just those um, I can't think of the word just those like little messages under posts saying like if something is yeah. possibly misinformation or something of the sort those were helpful and think pe make people look deeper into the information that they're reading. I'm gonna also, before I forget it, um, and so we can come back to it uh, later or, or move on. Yeah, we'll come back to it later, but um, it's really hard to be a social media executive right now. I'll be honest, Gary, I think it's probably worth it to be a social media exec right now. I mean, I'm not a social media exec myself. So I'm not saying they're not rich. I'm just saying <laughs> it's, it's hard right now. It's a challenging job. Yeah, that, that's fair. Um, I also have a question for Julia, which is that if you have, like, if you have um, these warning labels for people, um, you know, you should be thinking about this. Shouldn't you be like taking pretty much any information you take in? You should be giving it that extra level of criticism, or not criticism, I guess, but scrutiny. And then at that point, how do we avoid just desensitizing people to the labels? Yeah, I mean, like we would hope that's the way, but it's just not how people intake information on the internet. Like, I mean, I think all of us here probably do, but a lot of people I know just read something. They're like, oh, did you see this? I'm like, that that was an Onion article. Like that was like satire. <laughs> like some people just like don't realize the difference and they just read something and like take it in completely. Um, so. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So I, I got banned from Facebook for a month uh, <laughs> no, be, because I posted a, a joke uh, making fun of um, white supremacists mm -hmm. um, and they thought that I was supporting white supremacists. Yeah. Yeah, so like, yeah. So j jokes don't do very well in this censorship prone environment. Cause you can't like think that everyone has First of all, the same sense of humor, humor as you to even like understand something online that you're posting, like maybe your friends or whatever can obviously see that's sarcastic or whatever, but other people could maybe stand behind that as a truth post. Um, so yeah. You know, what this is making me realize is that speech is, um, it's, it's, it's so important but also we, we place so much emphasis in our politics about what people say and not what they do and not what they build. So I think it's like really, really important that we continue to use the word builder to describe our community members. Um, we're not talkers, we're figuring things out right now. We're dialoguers and we're builders. We're not like just posting tweets um, and trying to win petty little battles. So I just wanted to call that out, right? It's almost like, okay, well, this kind of goes in line with like, it's really hard to be a social media executive right now. You can't just fix democracy by just talking about it. I do want to add one caveat though. Um, I think that when we talk about movements, especially social impact movements, anything about any change, I think there is a role for everybody. And, and although, um, you know, this group, directly is not you know just talkers or doers i think there is still a role for people who are talkers and i think it's it's it would be wrong for us to sort of like um uh talk down on people who are just the talkers right i think there is still um uh room and, and there's still you know impact given uh provided by people who are you know the the keyboard warriors right i think you know there's sometimes where it's, it's probably like too much um but I do think that, you know, every little bit helps. And I think the most important thing to always remember is that there's a role for everybody in these movements. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, something that happened in this conversation, Julia, you were talking about how like, oh, like probably all of us check our sources or whatever, but like, I definitely don't like, and I think it's impossible with like how much we consume on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, I don't know, like I, I follow accounts on Instagram that like 
posts about the news and it's like for every single thing I scroll through like it's literally impossible with with the amount that we consume and um and Gary what you mentioned and this question I was going to make some sort of like response around like uh part of the part of what we need is like clear lines about like what the limitations of freedom of speech are especially on social media um like for instance like i know twitter and and, and facebook all social media platforms have guidelines that they don't really like strictly follow most of the time but what you brought up your story like made me realize that that's probably not the solution either because if they were to do that they would just like you know like censor certain words and that wouldn't always mean that like it was worth censoring so i think that's just like showing me how much more complex the issue is than i originally thought I'm not super caught up to date on Chinese censorship. I don't think you can be because they're updating it every day. But they ban like they banned Wayne Defu memes because people are making fun of the president for looking like Winnie the Pooh. Uh, they banned uh, like certain like uses of like, numbers, um, like basically anything that people can encode as like a symbol of resistance. Um, they would ban. So they just started banning like all sorts of like actual words that could be used in other like circumstances, right? So um, I mean, you know, part of me wishes we could like fast forward in the future and just see how like, yeah, I mean, you, you can't like, I hope that it's true that you just can't, you can't just keep banning every sort of like symbol. Uh, but certainly seems like they're that's that's an approach they're taking one thing kind of a necessary outgrowth i think of the discussion of what is censorship and what can you regulate before it becomes censorship really in order to ask that question you have to decide what is speech and right like like what constitutes speech so we have in the united states we have the citizens united rule which says that money is speech and personally i think that's really probably like, i think that is logistically flawed but logically flawed just because it doesn't like like you can't do anything basically now all of a sudden without regulating speech um, so what other things, Gary talked a little bit about symbols could constitute speech. Yeah, and to, to jump down to your question, Gary, about like, it's really hard to be, or I guess provocation. Um, I think that as this is especially true with like cancel culture, um, like there's a lot of things that like are so like off limits now or even if you don't perceive them to be as like off limits, it, it's it's really hard to predict what you're going to be canceled for. So like mine go, my mind goes to like what happened with Ellen, um, like the particular instance about the joke she made about quarantine being like prison. I, I like I didn't think that that was like as big as a deal as everyone made it. Um, obviously like she lives in a nice house, but it's like, it was clear that she was a making a joke, like she's a comedian. And I've seen other comedians who have gotten away with like 9-11 jokes and like not gotten any sort of like um like people haven't you know like criticized them for that and so it's just like really interesting because a lot of times you don't even know what to expect from the content that you put out there um and so i can imagine that it's really hard So when you meant social media executive, were you saying like someone that's posting on social media? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> I, 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 it's true. It's true what you yeah. said. Right. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's related, right? It's all related to speech. And yeah. I'm saying like Zuckerberg, Dorsey, his staff. Um, is it, um, does anyone want to like um, put on your defend that that sort of role hat, uh, Mariam? Defend like the defend. The yeah, defend how about, how right? like like what wh why might it be hard right now? Oh, why it's hard? Well, I mean, 
I, 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 I'd be interested in exploring that if no one else wants to take it. Well, I think it's like if you're silencing misinformation or what is being deemed as like misinformation or whatever it is right now, insinuating violence, um, you're taking these people off of one of the biggest platforms in the world on social media, but then they're all going to a platform like Parler and like, again, back to the fueling the fire point earlier. Um, it's like, are you, are, is it counterproductive? Is it starting more of an issue because all of these people are then ganging up on a different platform where they're only, again, they're not getting a feedback loop um, and it's just all of their opinions. Um, so it's like, is it fueling the fire more by doing that or are you actually helping the situation? It's like a weird thing to navigate. Yeah, I mean, I also think in this discussion, like a huge part of why it's so difficult is because of precedent, because like social media is a relatively new phenomenon. And like, although it doesn't seem like that for like me and for like a lot of people who use social media like avidly, it definitely is like something that there aren't like a lot of laws and like regulations about. And so for people who are starting to like say, okay, this person, we're gonna like, you know, suspend their account or do all of these things, it's pretty like new in the span of like what they're allowed to do. And because there aren't any like legal regulations on social media, it's kind of like up to them to set like the president for what is going to be like acceptable later on. And like, once they kind of start making th these decisions that'll kind of like set the trend for what people follow. So it is hard to like balance this. And like Julia said, like, if you just ban them, like people are gonna, it's not just gonna stop them. Like they're not gonna, you know, stop thinking the way they're thinking because like they're removing one source, but then you also have to recognize that that source was inciting a lot of violence and like at some point it's irresponsible to let them continue, you know, posting on social media because like we've seen multiple times, like what results from, you know, the postings that, you know, our president has put out there. So it's a very like fine line to like balance, um, which is again, why we're having this discussion in the first place, but it's hard just because it is so new and there's a lot of navigation to do around it. Wow, well said. I feel like it's also probably difficult to be an executive in any social media company right now because it's very difficult to keep your opinion out of the regulations that you're setting and it's really difficult because like if you're a social media executive and you're on like whichever side of the spectrum it's really hard to not try and just like stop people on the other side of the spectrum from saying things that you perceive as dumb but like to them it's their truth kind of tying it back to what we said earlier so I know that I would have a really difficult time with that and I'm sure that most people would okay so I'm I'm ready to go back on the no we shouldn't have go back to the no we shouldn't have sympathy side for a minute <laughs> because like yeah okay sure the job like no doubt the job is challenging it's whenever you're you know dealing with a decision that affects that many people if you don't think that decision is difficult to make then you are a terrible person um that's so that's the first thing but also at the same time we have these massive corporations twitter facebook to name just two of them google also that very deliberately set themselves up as the sole definitive organization on the internet like they they deliberately went out of their way to create a monopoly and just own the entire internet and the result of that means that they now have to make decisions that affect the entire internet and that was something they chose to do right so i'm i'm not Spider -Man. Gonna, yeah with great power <laughs> yeah exactly like they, they went out of their way to get all kinds of power early on and all kinds of money because they thought it would enrich themselves. And now what they're struggling to do, they're not struggling to make decisions in a way that will be best for the future of humanity and best for democracy. They're struggling to make decisions in a way that will be best for them to continue to protect their business model. And I don't have a lot of sympathy. Like, yeah, that's a hard, if that, if you, are finding that decision difficult to make. Like if you're trying to figure out how, what's the easiest way for you to make money and that's hard for you, fine, I'm okay with that.
you know, it's basically like you should have thought about this later but like 10 years ago <laughs> before you went on this path yeah really right? like, you don't want to be so zuckerberg has this whole line about facebook shouldn't be the arbiter of truth it's like okay well if you don't want to be the arbiter of truth you shouldn't have crushed vine and bought instagram right like there was a solution here and now this is your job so do it I have a I have a question. What what happens? What about so so? There's there's this has like a lot of complexities in terms of intersectionality and, and thinking about like how how all these kind of tie in together. But what what happens when you have a a well meaning organization advocacy group? Um, I mean, there's a ton out there, uh, so I won't name any specifically. But you know, what if they take money from you know large corporations that you know have monopolies or they do things that are not great for example a like a, a anti-smoking um uh organization that tells people you know you shouldn't smoke it's really bad for you it gives you cancer it kills you, you know, obviously there's so many bad things so many studies done that like this is bad and they're funded by large tobacco where then is the moral obligation to continue doing one or the other and what happens when they stop funding? What if you do something so much so that they actually stop giving you money when the people who are giving you money are the people who put you in the place to be able to do what you um, are supposed to be doing? This is why I don't really like nonprofit work because what you do is so dependent on people willing to fund you and that like messes with your values. But I I mean, I think if you're going into this work, right? Like, like you're doing it because you believe in something and you know what needs to be done to make things better. I don't think you should compromise your values in order to because like, I mean, like if you're taking money from those companies and you're not able to do what you were intended, like, like, and you're not able to do what you intended to do, like, what is the point of you still doing any of this at all? Well, well, the argument is simple. It's just like, oh, well, at least I'll do 80% of it. There's 20% I can't talk about, but I can do 80% of it. And this has happened, well, this happens a lot. Um, a funder will say, stop doing think tank stuff on this topic. You have all these other topics, just don't do this topic. Not defending it at all. That just literally, the calculus. That's how people sleep at night. But it, it happens mm -hmm. like constantly, like like the, the, the no smoking, the smoking cessation thing, like that, that is a real thing where you know, the more they talk about like not smoking, because there, there was this whole, I think, um, uh, marketing stunt about like, you know, smoking doesn't make you look cool. But then they like have this like 30 minute uh, or 30 second commercial of like Rihanna smoking and like all these celebrities smoking. And like, yeah, it looks really cool. I, I would want to smoke if like all these people I look up to are smoking. Um, you know, but but your goal is to stop people from smoking, but the people who are paying you and like, making sure that you have a budget to get a Rihanna here to, to actually be able to do the things that like you think are good, actually do the opposite for other people that actually gets that 20% of, you know, the population to say like, oh, wow, like this had the opposite effect that you were intending and now I'm going to smoke and that's what they're banking on. So like what then, right? Because even if your intention is good, even if the things you're doing is still good and like 80% of the way there, you're still doing bad because you're taking money from bad people, but without that money, you can't do anything at all, then what? I don't have an answer. I just, I'm curious to hear everyone's thoughts. Yeah, I think in Ken's example, I think the 20% left undone wasn't just like 20% of the task that you didn't do. It was 20% of the task that went the other way. And then I think, but like, and I think it wasn't exactly 20%. Like I think that example, you did more harm than good there. And I think as long as you're doing more good than harm, you should keep doing that thing. Because in the aggregate, right, if everyone takes an action that does more good than harm, then you, and you just repeat that infinitely, 
then you eventually just infinitely are doing good. Obviously, the more good you can do, the better. So if you can do more good by not taking that money from an organization, go for it. But I do think that in the aggregate, doing more good than harm is always the way to go, no matter what. Okay, I think the, I think the smart thing that, like, I know that there's tech billionaires that have that donate to like every every like think tank that would write opposition research against them. Um, it's really cheap for them. It's like a PR budget. So if every if every think tank is not talking about a single issue, um, well, I think you 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 you. Uh, you, you get what we're in right now, which is like, we're only talking about it because it's like too late. <laughs> and I'm not gonna talk about which um, donor um, did this, but one, one, one tech guy uh, said, if you don't stop looking into, if you, if you don't cease your anti-monopoly research, I'm going to stop funding you they said that to us no a think tank oh okay i think that makes sense i mean like i guess where my head goes to then is like we need a better way for these like small organizations to like communicate and coordinate to identify where are these gaps and then find ways to you know like fund people pursuing whatever gaps but like continue okay I mean like like you need a way to take old world money and and like invest it into like new world things like I don't like I don't think like refusing money is the answer right nothing is going to get done but like if like the researching mon like like if the researching monopoly work isn't going to be funded by monopolies it needs to be funded by like sure. ordinary people. Yep. Ordinary, yeah. Yep. Like I don't know, just like more like I don't know, grassroots coordination to like make sure important things happen. So there's another thing I want to add that I just thought of. Uh, that it builds off of what Ashley was saying. And it's like all the best questions, Star Trek has an answer for this one. And um, in this case, it's in Star Trek Picard. And so it's set like in the future after next gen, if that means anything to you, I don't know if it does, but if it does, that's the, the time frame. And basically what happened is an alien planet got blown up. And so like all the inhabitants of this planet suddenly turned into these space refugees trying to flee. And the Federation decided, no, we're not gonna help them. And Picard has, was trying to get the Federation to help them and they're like fine we'll give you like a couple of ships and that's it we're not gonna but we're not gonna have a whole massive thing um to to help all of them the way we should and so in response to that picard was just like all right you guys are horrible i'm out and quits and then he spends years racked with guilt because the line that they have in there is you couldn't save everybody so you decided to save nobody and that's not a decision we should make Right, just because you decide, just because we can't do 100% of what we wanted to accomplish doesn't mean we should do 0% of what we want to accomplish. That's what Ashley was saying. Like, if you don't take any money, nothing's going to get done. Also, uh, I'm just happy that we're talking about this because the more that we talk about, the more, more courage I think we'll have to continue talking about it and having the kind of collective like virtue to, or just work ethic to find donors that don't force us to compromise our values. I don't know if I've heard this, like, it's not like I, I don't just like watch like nonprofit like philanthropy panels for fun. But I've like very rarely talked, like heard this conversation being had. Um, you know. 
Yeah, and then I feel like within well-meaning orgs, like there needs to be a system set up like where people getting money are different from, or like at least there's some sort of barrier between the people getting money and the people figuring out what to do next um, so that things don't get mixed up. Because I think what gets really dangerous is like when we start BSing other people and then you start BSing yourself and you don't even realize it. Yeah, it's, I... No, sorry. No, I was just gonna say, I completely agree. Cause I think that like, like we were saying, like it's important to take this money because like we do need money to do all the things that we need to do, but like don't consumers have like a right to know that like the message that they're being like broadcasted to is also funded by a certain like person other than the organization and like how that might impact the message. And then when people are taking that money, like when we talk about like, oh, overall it's good versus overall it's bad, like that's super subjective. And then could you rationalize it to yourself to be like, oh, well, I think it's good just so that like you can say, oh yeah, like I wanna take this money so I can like rationalize it to make it seem like it's good. Um, and then you kind of get into a hot spot because like good versus evil is like extremely subjective. So it's hard to kind of like find a way to streamline that in order to make it still ethical in the nonprofit world. And when money's tied into all of it, it just like makes it a thousand times harder to kind of like figure out. I feel like a lot of what we're saying is super like subjective and it's really based on a lot of like morals that are out there and we kind of like touched on at the beginning of this conversation like well we don't really know what the line is to be drawn for morals so I just want to like we're also talking about like doing more harm than good doing more good than harm whatever so I just want to like put it out there to you guys not necessarily as a question or provocation but just something to think about if like every single organization, every single person, whatever, had a net worth of the good that they're doing versus the bad that they're doing, do you think that the world would be different if we looked at it as a whole, as like a net worth, as opposed to like, oh, this person or this organization said this thing one time, so I don't support them now, kind of like cancel culture. Like, how do you think looking at it oh. as an overall would change things? Totally, a, a, a big like push that I mean, it's really hard to implement, but we don't really pen penalize uh, like corporations for the externalities that they produce. In other words, like when they destroy the rainforest, um, it's, it's, it's like not really built in our system to track these sort of things. Um, so 100%, right? If, if we were like, if you could click on some corporation and see that how many like how much rainforest they destroyed or how much how much biodiversity they destroyed no one would no one would would purchase stuff from them right um and similarly if if you could see that like like something that i personally would love and i'm sure other people would as well like if um if i could if i could see that like uh like um like I, I, I give my time or a micro grant to like some, some like high schooler, right? Like, like how did that shift their trajectory over time? And how many, what are all the people that they impacted over time? Um, and so I can see like a tree of, of, of the influence, right? And then you have like, then you're incentivized to keep doing good because it's, then you get this dopamine hit. Instead of the dopamine hit being like retweets and, and likes, it's like actual civic contribution. So my question, I think that would be a cool thing to do if you could figure out how to compare different goods. Like certain goods, I guess, could definitely outweigh others, like saving somebody's life versus by like pulling them out of the way of a speeding bus versus saving somebody five minutes by keeping the bus from leaving without them. You know, like those are things you could compare. But there are others where it's, harder and you can't really say well i think this good is definitively greater than that good um yeah because the feedback loops because you don't know if like something that might be good for you like for the next in the in the near term right could actually like cause downward spirals for all sorts of things yeah so that's that's the tricky thing or it's uh, you should check out uh, joan i think you would like this site slash publication eighty thousand hours 
it's all about like um so you have like the idea is that you have eighty thousand hours uh, in your like life to do work oh um, um that's what that one book you sent me end spiral the whole thing is that what yeah I, I i'm sure they reference okay. like um some sort of tens of thousands of hours yeah and that and that's really important to think about because um like what is your u-shaped hole such that you actually have a net positive impact but also you have to figure out your own philosophy and almost like metaphysics about what good is right and and does anyone like remember talking about that with their teachers and if you did like congrats that's extremely lucky so i guess and in, in just to like you know very briefly talk about social impact work that i've done in the past it, it's it's really hard to sort of because you you never it's very tricky when you start to say that like you know the good that i do is better than the good that you do for like xyz reasons when all we're doing is is try to have some sort of so uh, like positive impact um the way that I like to look at it and the way that I, I compare it um, is is like fruits, right? You, you can, like apples, oranges, bananas are all three different fruits, uh, but they're all sweet, right? So you can compare relative sweetnesses to each other, but you can never actually say that like, oh, this apple is so much sweeter than your banana. Uh, but I can say that my apple is like, you know, relatively sweeter than other apples that I've eaten. And this banana is also very sweet, but all these fruits are still sweet. Like you're still contributing positively um just in different ways uh but it is it is really hard to look at it from a longitudinal scale of like you know it's good now but what happens like 10 years in the future right i had half this apple now but 10 years in the future like this apple is not going to be good it could actually be left there and it could be really bad and and you know we look at that the same way that i guess i i make that example because you look at plastics and, and the way that plastics are looked at as like you know so great now right like we have like you know recycled plastic like these are these are bpa free like these are recyclable plastics but they're not really right they just kind of sit there and, and they like it takes like a hundred years to to you know mm. degrade it's not like truly yeah. biodegradable the same way you throw it in the soil and you know you can use it it takes a long time to be done it's better than you know the status quo but it's not maybe, maybe right maybe because it could it could make people complacent Exactly, you and, and you wouldn't know. You don't even know if it's better. So I guess one of the takeaways is that we have to be really humble when we when we when we think that we're doing good, and when we're complacent about just like like our impact, the impact of others, um, like kind of rightfully skeptical about um, like organizations that really talk about their impact <laughs> as well. Um, I want to be mindful of the time. This is such a good question. Kind of clearly, we had a, a lot to talk about. Anyone want to like talk about anything else before we go to um, reflection? I think one more point I wanted to add to like the social media execs um, section. Like, I think a tough thing right now um, to set boundaries on is like ominous statements. I feel like these have become like increasingly mm. popular over the past year or two. Like the mm. truth come to light or like they don't know what's coming like I feel like I see statements like <laughs> all the and like I've just over the past year or two I just see it so much more of course on like Facebook but like it almost feels like people being brainwashed to like feel threatened at all times or something I don't know what but like an example it's kind of a morbid example like a few years ago there was like um, a kid at a high school that I went to growing up and um, he was like planning like some type of like bombing or school shooting thing. And like, he was tweeting like these ominous statements. Obviously someone like that deserves to be reported and get their Twitter platform taken down. But when it's like these people nowadays because these statements have become increasingly popular um, and it's not in a violent way, it's more like, oh, I, I know information that you don't whether it's like political or world information that's gonna come to light and they're being taken off platforms. Um, is that the same thing? Like, uh, it, it's a weird thing to navigate that, like a lot of people yesterday got taken off Twitter for, um, so, yeah. Really good stuff. Any, anyone else have anything um, before we wrap up? I guess the last thing is like adding to what Julia just said. It, it's not just like 
suspending, but like, do you now action it? Like, what is your moral obligation to actually do something about it? Someone who has seen it before it was suspended or as the social media site, like, are you supposed to now alert the authorities and like, which authorities do you alert? And how does that actually infringe upon, you know, what we think is freedom of speech, right? Because you could say something that could just be like satirical. You could be saying something, which in that case, obviously it was not, but you know, you could be saying something that's like facetious. Um, you just can't tell in, in writing. You can't tell in text of like that is that is uh, like a joke or not. And and it's the same thing on the other side of like the law. You know when when you know the FBI or the CIA like pulls your transcripts, they don't look at it and say like oh that was clearly a joke. They look at it and say like that was not a joke. You clearly meant that you were going to you know X Y Z. Like why did you say that? Uh, so there's two sides of just like this idea of like you know being able to track everything it said and like what someone does with that information is still subjective of like, is that right or wrong? Well said. Madison, let's, let's do this. You wanna explain? Yeah, so I just dropped the link in the chat to these notes and you all can take a moment to look over them and then you can shout out your reflections. We don't have to go in this order. Um, and then don't feel limited to just speak where your name is. You can like respond to what other people are saying as well. One thing I'm just realizing is we started on freedom of speech and we ended up talking about like the nature of relative good, which I don't even know if that's a word, but um, but that's really interesting. Right? On the note, um, a question um, for all of us is, can we meaningfully level up democracy without starting to define some of the, the words that we take for granted, like, like, like all these words we take for granted, good, bad, progress, um, mostly good, like uh, free for, I mean, freedom of speech, right? Like, I guess one thing that this, it's really cool actually, like one thing that this trek uh, reminded me was <clears throat> um, why this trek format is so great because I, I would imagine that all of you learned a lot about this topic today. Certainly at least where other people are at uh, about this topic, which is so important for democracy. Cause it's all about, it's like so much about symbols and like symbol warfare and like clashes and uh, just lack of coordination. So if we don't define our words really clearly uh, we're not gonna get anywhere. I think something that kind of I got from the track was like, I don't know, I just feel like so much of our conversation, like so much of conversation around free speech is about like what other people can and cannot say. So it's like, you know, it's about censorship. But like, I like how our conversation kind of like went against that. And we talked a lot more about like, looking at ourselves and like the technologies we use and like thinking about like the the skills that we would need to develop to be like a more discerning audience or like I don't know like I feel like like a lot of times challenges with free speech are blamed on other people instead of like looking at ourselves and like thinking about well how exactly can like we change or how can we grow to better deal with what currently exists. So well said. And uh, on that point about we kind of project our like cri cri critiques on to, uh, um, our, we, we, uh, we see fault in other people that we don't see ourselves, I guess. And it's, um, I, really, I realize a moment in my head at some point in the last couple of years when I was like, 
ha, look at these people that are so unempathetic. And that's just like a paradox, right? It's just like, it's actually like a, it's like, or just like stupid, right? Like you're, like, you're not empathetic. You're actually not empathizing with the people that, um, I guess, in at least one sort of aspect, were not on your level of empathy. Um, but this happens all the time, right? Pe people see the fault in other people and like they're like exemplifying the problem themselves. Yeah, I agree. Um, another thing that I liked about this entire trek was that um, it's, so obviously all the treks are kind of based on like, how can we make our society better when we're looking at these topics? And I like how it wasn't necessarily like we ended up talking about big corporations because they do genuinely influence our society so much. So I like that we were able to subconsciously recognize how affected we are and how affected our society is by like social media corporations and things like that. And I also liked how we were all willing to admit um, what things are objective and what things are subjective. I definitely agree with that. And I think that like, in terms of like charting my own next steps, this conversation has really prompted me to think a lot more about how like corporations or like governments or things like that can really influence things. Because um, I don't know if you guys have like heard of the social dilemma on Netflix, but when I watched that, I was just like, whoa. And I keep learning, especially this year, like I just keep learning more and more about how like big overarching like institutions have like influence the way I guess that we go about life and like what's quote unquote normal and I think I take a lot of that for granted because I just assume that it is normal when in reality like it doesn't have to be that way and like more and more I'm thinking about like how we can change the status quo and how it can be different and a lot of these treks just like force me to reflect on different aspects of society that we can change or that aren't functioning like optimally so I definitely want to look into more of that and especially through the lens of um like governments, because I do have like a lot of family in Kashmir, which is under like lockdown. And so like they have a lot of, um, you know, they're not able to communicate a lot and they face a lot of um, censorship. And so I think like challenging these systems that we're currently like operating in and seeing how we can create better ones um, is really important. So, yeah. Um, for my reflection, I'll just say this helped me realize how complex the issue is, especially like in terms of censorship. Um, and back to Eric was saying about defining words, because I think that are, there are a lot of solutions out there that sound like really simple and agreeable, but when you get to the root of them, they aren't. So like when Jonah was like, yeah, just like you should be doing more good than harm. I was like, yeah, that's what you should be doing. But then Mariam was like, well, it's like it's hard to know like when you're doing more harm than good or more good than harm or um, and then it's also like you could like really be like BSing yourself about like and like trying to like rationalize what you're doing just to, like continue doing what you are uh, like to keep your job. And so just like realizing that there's a reason why this is such a big issue because it's like so incredibly complex especially when it comes about down to like subjective things like good versus bad i'm so bad at reflections but i think these just get really good every time they get better every time and they're always really enjoyable so just like to say that We save the best for last. Does Ken already go or no? I didn't go. I, I don't even know what. I, I'm just like amazed that this conversation is happening. And like, uh, I'm thinking like, you know, uh, like five years ago, would I have been able to articulate everything that everyone else has articulated uh, over the past hour? And probably the answer is no. I don't, I don't think I, I have been tooled with the vocabulary or like at least even the necessary um I guess worldview to be able to have said everything that was said I, I, I mean I'm just amazed <laughs> I I have really nothing to add this is this is awesome
I'm, I'm so glad that it's happening. I'm, I'm glad that like there's more things in the future. I'm, I'm even glad that these questions are being asked because I don't, I don't, I think when I, when I first started, you know, uh, working in social impact, I, I never thought about these things of like, you know, what is good or bad, right? I only thought what I'm doing is good. Um, you know, even if it's a little good, it's better than what was done before without considering the consequences of like, you know, what are the second order effects here? Like, what if I took money from X, Y, Z? You can always rationalize everything that you do, right? No matter what it is, you can always rationalize it. Um, so, I mean, it's amazing to think about, you know, to even have the ability to like play 40 chess with yourself. Yeah, I mean, our community is really amazing. And um, it's uh, also like, these are really simple processes, as you can see, like, and we've literally every time we've done this, we've, iter we've changed one thing, like, and it just keeps getting better and better. Um, yeah, and so like, can imagine like, young people everywhere I mean, or just intergenerational groups everywhere doing this. Like, imagine like millions of these conversations happening a month even, right? In like several years from now, you know? Um, one, one, one way that we yeah. kind of think about what we're doing is we're incubating uh, people, you know, projects, processes, ideas that are relevant to building the future. Um, so what, what, what allows for these questions to, to be welcomed, right? It's these sort of environments, these sort of practices that, that, that enable that. And hopefully, not hopefully, um, more and more people will see what you're seeing. Um, and this will just spread like wildfire. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the question for me is, is, you know, I always, I always wonder, you know, what is the right incentivization here, right? Because there, there's clearly something driven more than, you know, financial um, you know, motivators. So like, what is it that actually continues to push this forward and continues to multiply? Um, yeah, I don't know. This is, this is super cool. Elon, partnering with Elon. Serious. Yeah. Yeah. Part That'd be partnering, awesome. Partnering with Ethereum. Partnering yeah, with cryptocurrency. I mean, we're, we're on, we're on the way. Um, no, I want to leave the last um, kind of thought for Madison. Oh, uh, well, I, I already shared my uh, meaning, kind of meaningful reflection, any meaningful contribution to that. And so I uh, just want to thank you all for coming. Thank you, Kenneth. Again, it was lovely to have you. I mean, we can have you on again in the future. Yeah, wh whatever, whatever. Thanks yeah. for, thank you for having for me on, the sh uh, on short notice. This is really yeah. fun. I mean, I just know. Thanks for writing with me. Just knew that you would be able to contribute a lot. All right. Yeah. Have a great rest of your weekend. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.